If you could turn with me to Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 42. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders, and all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day, the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. If you could pray with me. Lord, thank you so much that as we've read um, this passage over and over again the past few weeks, that you've taught us something new um, every week, Lord. I pray that you continue to show us um, what a community chasing after you looks like um, and that you'd be with us in that. Lord. Um, thank you so much for allowing us to gather here today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You may have heard this story uh, before from the person who wrote it as well, but it was written by a man named Horatio Spafford. And he lost a great fortune in the Chicago fire of 1871. Around the same time, he lost his four-year-old son uh, to scarlet fever. Thinking a vacation would do them good, decided it would be good to go to England with his family. Sent his four daughters and wife ahead of him. There was a shipwreck and only his wife survived. After that was when he wrote this song. And as we were just singing that, I was just reminded of all the like, there's so much water imagery, storm imagery, the clouds being peeled back like a scroll. Those words have a different kind of meaning when you think about water, storms. And I, I, I know just like, um, because life is hard, uh, a number of us in the room uh, probably are maybe singing that song or watching other people singing that song or thinking about that song and you're like, it is well with my soul is not particularly what I would say right now. Uh, and today we're going to be, if you can't tell, there's a, a table here with the Lord's Supper or communion or what other traditions call the Eucharist. Our gathering today is going to center around the table. And what I hope to communicate and show you is that regardless of where you come into the room today, whether you are celebrating and happy or whether you are mourning, tired, exhausted, don't have any words, you're invited to sit at the table of God and be in his, in his presence. Um, a while, I say a while back, like earlier this year, I got the chance to connect with a pastor slash uh, author who I really look up to. I met him in uh, Nashville, and he invited me to be part of this cohort thing that he was helping facilitate. Met him again in the first gathering in LA, and once we started talking, he remembered having talked to me, which I was like, that's pretty cool. Um, and then he, after talking for us, I was like, oh, I'm doing this thing in Nashville coming up soon. You should totally come. I was like, okay, cool. Um, I was late for the thing in Nashville, uh, ironically, because of the cohort that he started, I was a part of, and we had a gathering at that same time. And so I was late, and I came in, and this pastor, uh, they were doing like a a breakout or Q&A type thing. Um, he, from the front, was like, Trey, I was wondering if you were going to come. I was like, I am so shocked that you would remember me, let alone remember my name, and remember that I live in Nashville. Um, and he's like, all right, we'll talk after. Like, and they were going to a brewery um, afterwards. And um, on the way out, he's like, do you need a ride over there? And I said, no, I brought my car. Looking back, I wish I said, no, yeah, of course I need a ride. I'll ride over there with you. Um, I really do, like, looking back, I wish I'd done that. Um, but we went to the brewery, had a beer together, and talked, and like felt so seen. There is something about an invitation to a table, an invitation to sit, to eat, to have a drink, to have a coffee with someone, an invitation into someone's home. More than whatever person that it is that you look up to, we are invited to sit at the table of God not based on what you've done, not based on what you offer, not based on whether you're rich or poor, man or woman, any of those things, just based on he loves you and he wants a relationship with you. Um, as we were uh, just singing and praying, I was reminded of, um, we had a prayer uh, gathering uh, maybe a month ago uh, for our church. And one of the things that we do in those prayer gatherings is just make space to hear from the Lord. Um, and one of the things that I was hearing 
from the Lord. This might sound kind of cheesy, but as I was like praying and processing, I just kind of like got this sense of, uh, he likes me. Like God likes me. He really, really does. <laughs> you know, almost like, you know, if you're ever in a romantic relationship or whatever, and you're like, they like me. They really, really do. And so I just want to encourage us today. Like God like likes you and wants to spend time with you. I think oftentimes, at least for me, you know, the invitation to like spend time with God or whatever felt sometimes like a little bit of a guilt trip. Like I need to be doing it more. Um, and, you know, there's conviction in like I need to spend time with God. I mean, sure. But I just want us to understand today, like it is a beautiful thing that God wants to spend time with you. Um, I heard uh, an author who was talking about prayer said that I, I have this sneaking suspicion that like God really enjoys spending time with me. And I think that's true. God enjoys spending time with us. Like he really, really does. And today we're going to look at this through the image of, of the table. We're continuing our series in the book of Acts, looking at the early church, looking at things that the disciples devoted themselves to. The first week we talked about the apostles' teaching. Last week we talked about fellowship, particularly that Christian fellowship centers around Jesus being resurrected from the dead and being people being filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, and then we talked about a couple social distinctives of the early church as well. Uh, today we are talking about sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, or eating and drinking together. Simple as that. Rosaria Butterfield, in her book, The Gospel Comes with a House Key, described a practice of hospitality as radically ordinary hospitality. That things like sharing in meals together, like what we do in our growth groups when we eat together every single week, is actually a profoundly significant thing that we do. And if you think about it, just in, in light of this, no matter where you come from, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, whether you believe in Jesus, don't believe in Jesus, whether you're rich or poor, man or woman, married, not married, kid, senior adult, all of us got to eat. And whenever we eat, we remember that we need something external to ourselves to survive. I am not the one who is the sustainer of life. I need something other than me. Eating and drinking was central to the early church and also to the life and teachings of Jesus. Tim Chester, in his book, A Meal with Jesus, wrote this. He said, there are three ways in which the New Testament completes the sentence, this sentence. The Son of Man came, in Mark 10, 45, it says, came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Luke 19, 10, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Then Luke 7, 34, the Son of Man has come eating and drinking. He argues that the first two are statements of purpose, and then the third is a statement of methodology. How did Jesus come? He came eating and drinking. Meals were not an afterthought to Jesus' ministry. They were central. Food played an important role in Jesus' life and ministry. As I've mentioned over the past couple weeks, uh, the book of Acts is really like part two to the book of Luke, to the gospel of Luke. And in uh, what we see in the book of Acts is the early church doing kind of the same things that Jesus did. And we see uh, in the book of Luke repeated themes of the table and eating together. A Roman Catholic, um, Father Robert Karras, concludes this. In Luke's gospel, Jesus is either going to a meal, at a meal, or coming from a meal. I mean, in reality, aren't we all kind of doing that? I'm either at a meal, going to a meal, or coming from a meal. Tim Chester wrote this, and I'm going I'm to read this. This is a lengthier quote, but I think it will be helpful for you just to see how important this theme of eating is for Jesus. He did evangelism and discipleship around a table with some grilled fish, a loaf of bread, and a pitcher of wine. Luke's gospel is full of stories of Jesus eating with people. Luke 5, Jesus eats with tax collectors and sinners at the home of Levi. In Luke 7, Jesus is anointed at the home of Simon the Pharisee during a meal. In Luke 9, Jesus feeds the 5,000. In Luke 10, Jesus eats in the home of Martha and Mary. In Luke 11, Jesus condemns the Pharisees and teachers of the law at a meal. In Luke 14, Jesus is at a meal when he urges people to invite the poor to their meals rather than their friends. In Luke 19, Jesus invites himself to dinner with Zacchaeus. In Luke 22, we have the account of the Last Supper. In Luke 24, the risen Christ has a meal with the two disciples in Emmaus and then later eats fish with the disciples in Jerusalem. Food, 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 food. Eating and drinking. There is something about the table. 
In addition to this, we have numerous references in the Gospel of Luke where Jesus references food or uses it as an example. In Luke 14, we see a parable of a great banquet that Jesus describes. In Luke 15, we see the story of the prodigal sons where the younger son takes his inheritance and blows it and then comes back and the father throws him a great party or a feast. Food, food, food. And y'all are probably slightly hungry. Just worth noting, it's Carly's birthday today. Um, If you haven't told her happy birthday, make sure you do. Um, Carly's like, please stop. (laughs) Uh, We do have, uh, you can grab it during the sermon or after, we do have some uh, extra bagels from this morning from Creep Hall Bagel. Help yourself uh, to those. They are delicious. Um, And it's kind of an object lesson for the sermon if you eat while I'm preaching today. So enjoy that. But Jesus ate and drank with people so much that one of the accusations against him was that he was a glutton and a drunkard. Luke 7, 34, that verse we read part of earlier, the son of man has come eating and drinking, and you say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. A glutton eats too much, a drunkard drinks too much. He's obviously Jesus, perfect in all of his ways, fully God, fully man, but he must have ate and drank enough that people would have had an accusation against him. He certainly didn't not eat or not drink. He did those things with with people. In other words, Jesus' meals were not an afterthought to his ministry. Meals were crucial. He ate with Pharisees as well as his disciples, as well as tax collectors, and who were described as sinners. All across the board, he ate with them. He ate with a range of people, evangelism, discipleship, mission, all of this. The table played an essential role in Jesus' life and ministry, and also in the early church. We see this in Acts 2, 42 through 47. We see it in 42 with the reference to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper. And then if you go on to verse 46, we see kind of two more references to food. Meeting in homes for the Lord's Supper and sharing their meals with great joy and generosity. It's mentioned multiple times, eating and drinking together, sharing in meals. Meals were central, and the invitation to the table of God remains central to the message of Christianity. And I think about this in relation to a time such as now, whereas we talked about this some last week with how many of us struggle with loneliness, which when I say how many of us, I mean all of us struggle with feeling lonely at times. The invitation to sit at the table of God with other people is so profound. And I don't I think it is essential whenever we think about discipleship, whenever we think about evangelism, whenever we think about ministry, whenever we think about any of these really spiritual things, we have to think about eating and drinking together. What Rosaria Butterfield once again called radically ordinary hospitality. Radical in the sense that Jesus welcomed all to be a part of his family and to sit at the table. Not everybody accepted, but people are invited in. And ordinary in the sense of We're eating and drinking together. We're making food and we're making a little extra and you're welcome to come and join. Normal. We see this also, this hospitality piece exemplified in later places in the New Testament as well. In Romans, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality elsewhere. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Later, or another place, Matthew 10, whoever receives you receives me. And whoever receives me, this is Jesus, receives him who sent me. Hebrews 13, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. The rule of St. Benedict, written about the year 540, says, all guests who present themselves are to be welcomed as Christ. For he himself will say, I was a stranger and you welcomed me. In other words, the way that we welcome people into our lives, into our homes, over a meal, over a drink, is like welcoming in Christ. The theologian and chef, which is a cool kind of combo, uh, Simon Carey Holt, uh, I saw this reference in Tim Chester's book, wrote this concerning hospitality. At base, hospitality is about providing a space for God's spirit to move. Setting a table, cooking a meal, washing the dishes is the ministry of facilitation. Providing a context in which people feel loved and welcome and where God's spirit can be at work in their lives. Hospitality is a very ordinary business, but in its ordinariness is its real worth. I was reading uh, this week, and um, I'm not going to make some super profound point about this, but the number of meals that families eat together has radically decreased over the past 20 years. I want to say the later numbers that I saw were around like uh, three times a week 
Uh, usually that a family would eat together. Not that long ago, it was five. Uh, not that long ago, it was much, uh, much more than that. Then you also throw into a lot of people don't eat meals together, or when they do, we're on our phones, we're watching TV, which I'm not like against ever watching TV while you're eating. Sometimes I like that, and that's fine. But my point is, uh, I think sometimes we have forgotten, like eating and drinking together, sharing in meals is not just about getting physical nourishment. It's something spiritual, like in our relationship with God that happens, that rem reminds us that we are human beings. It also is a way in which we develop companionship with one another. This is fascinating. The word companion actually comes from two Latin words, cum, meaning together or with, and panis, me meaning bread. Together or with bread, companionship, kind of like eating bread together. We all got to eat, and whenever we eat, we are reminded that we need something outside of us to sustain us. There is something about the table. And there's something about this invitation to a meal or drink with someone, to spend time with someone. And, I mean, whether you're rich or poor, man or woman, young or old, we all got to eat. We all need calories. And we all need friends. There's something about the table. And the culmination of our gathering today is going to be partaking in communion or the Lord's Supper, or what other traditions call the Eucharist. And I hinted at this last week, but one of the things early Christians were uh, accused of was a practice of cannibalism, actually, uh, which was because of the Lord's Supper, because it's Christ's body broken for you and Christ's blood shed for you. And I say that to say not that the accusations were right, but just to say that it was such an important part of their gathering that there was an accusation of something around it. Now, Christians have debated uh, what the purpose of like, communion is or what like, the, the presence of God is like in, in communion or the Eucharist. Roman Catholics traditionally believed in something called transubstantiation, which is that the bread and wine literally become the body and blood of Christ. Uh, other traditions hold to something, you may have heard this language, an outward sign of an inward reality, that, uh, that communion or the Lord's Supper is more symbolic. Uh, that tends to be the language that I've used most of like my ministry and growing up, but I think there is more to it than just a symbol. I don't have like a fully formed theological opinion about it, but I think that God's presence really is with us in a powerful sort of way, past just something like symbolic. And we are invited to sit and be at God's table. And so the question for us today that I want us to ponder is who are you inviting to sit at your table? as a reflection of God inviting you. There's a way of seeing the theme of the table as a message of the good news of Jesus moving from the beginning of the scriptures to the end. Um, maybe three months ago, Israel, in a panel discussion we were having on Sabbath, Israel's back there if you don't know Israel, um, mentioned when we were talking about Sabbath, he mentioned that a number of people make a case concerning communion, that it is something in which we look back at the past, look at the present, and we look into the future. And the imagery of the table, I would argue, is a way in which you can see God's presence being made known throughout the course of scriptures. Let's start with the past. The story of the Bible opens up by God speaking all of creation into existence. And then what does he do? He places man and woman into a garden. And what instructions does he give them? They can start eating. That they can eat from every tree of the garden except for this one the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What do we see in Genesis 3? What do they do? They see that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, or the fruit of that tree, looks good for eating, and so they eat of it, trusting their own voice over God's, and they were sent out of the garden after being clothed by God. We see a theme of like concerning the fruit of the vine popping up later. We see stories of goodness and celebration tied with the drinking of wine and feasting, and also stories of like the fruit of the vine being taken advantage of, like with Noah getting drunk. Fast forward, we see a story in Exodus where God sustains the Israelites with manna from heaven. Fast forward into Leviticus, and we see a number of instructions regarding food, most of which seem very abstract and strange to us today. Without diving into too many specifics, a couple worth noting. Uh, festivals and feast, feasting times as a way of orienting our calendars around remembering who God is, who we are, and who it is that sustains us. There's instructions concerning grain and other things about leaving things for the poor and the foreigners. In other words, the food that we have, our daily bread, is not just ours, but it belongs to God, and we are to steward it and use it as a 
resource to help other people. We also see some specific instructions that you're probably like, what is this in there for? But we see some specific instructions concerning even uh, some meat. Uh, and when you are to eat meat, that you like, when you kill the animal, you drain the blood onto the ground uh, before you are to eat the animal. Um, and the image that's given is that the blood is the life force of the creature. All very strange um, for, I think, our, our modern years. But uh, think about it in this way. Uh, in Genesis, God formed human out of the dust of the ground, right? So ground is where human life came from. Think about it from an ancient sort of perspective. Every time that you were to go and eat this type of meat, when you pour the blood back on the ground, what does it remind you? Where does life come from? Not from me. It comes from God. I'm returning it back to who it comes from. I do not cause the life to be born. I do not cause any of this to be sustained. That is fully God. And I know that seems somewhat strange to our modern ears, but my, my point is simple, that everything we do, including eating and drinking, sharing in meals with one another, both feast and normal meals, are meant to point us back to remembering who God is. And uh, this is not my field of expertise, but we are uh, in what I see is we are more disconnected from our food sources than ever. Um, and I am probably the worst at knowing like where my food comes from, just to be honest. Uh, but a practice like uh, praying before we eat a meal, something along those lines, is a way of tuning our hearts, calibrating our hearts to remember where this food ultimately comes from. When I pray a simple prayer like, God, thank you for this food and thank you for the hands that prepared it, I'm being reminded that I am in need of him and something external to me to provide it. This seemingly ordinary act of meaning is, of eating is latent with divine significance. We see it in Psalm chapter 23, the Lord is my shepherd, that famous passage. We go on, you go on later in it, it says that he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies and he anoints my head with oil and my cup overflows. That there is a way in which eating and drinking, even in the midst of craziness in the world, when it feels like I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death and everything is wrong, there is a way in which when I sit down at the table, I sit there if things are awful, I sit there if things are good, I sit there if I'm with friends, and I sit there if I'm by myself. Maybe I'm sitting on the couch if I'm by myself, but you get the picture. Regardless, I need to eat, and I'm reminded of who it is that sustains me. It's not me, it's God. We obviously get to the Lord's Supper when reflecting on the past and Christ's body broken for us and blood shed for us, and we'll unpack that in a moment. But I want us to fast forward to the book of Revelation, chapter 19. There is a picture of a marriage feast between Christ and his church, starting in the later part of verse six. Praise the Lord, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice, and let us give honor to him, for the time has come for the wedding feast of the Lamb. It's reference to Jesus. And his bride, the church, has prepared herself. She has been given the finest of pure white linen to wear, for the fine linen represents the good deeds of God's holy people. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. And he added, these are true words that come from God. And so what we start to get is this image of the table of eating and drinking stemming from Genesis to Revelation, that when we eat and drink together, we remember who it is that sustains the world. And we also look forward to the day that we get to live again in perfect harmony with God and with one another, looking forward to that marriage feast. There's this table image of being invited to partake in life with God and God making a way for us to do that. We see a connection with the tree of knowledge of good and evil, where Humankind partook in that, in, in that fruit, and then what happens? Leads to sin and death, eventually becoming into a cross, and what symbolizes in a lot of ways the tree of the knowledge of good and evil then becomes transformed into the tree of life, offering life for all of those who follow and trust in Jesus and put their hope in him. We see the fruit of the tr knowledge of good and evil where they thought it would make them know what was good and evil and led to them actually choosing evil over good. We see Jesus later on on the cross pray this, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. We see a reversal of what we thought would be good and God reversing it, inviting all to partake in life with him. We see Christ's body broken and his blood shed for us. So the question is, 
How do we respond to God's invitation to sit in the present? What does the early church look like? It looks a lot like eating together. We can overcomplicate it. I mean, there's plenty of things that we could talk about that the early church did, but central to it was eating together, sharing in meals with one another, including the Lord's Supper. And people at the table of all walks of life and from all backgrounds, those who believe in Jesus and those who didn't, those who, yeah, of all different social statuses, who people would be upset about having at their dinner table, were all sitting there together. It was a radical commitment to hospitality, And I want you to even think about, uh, in the language of the Lord's Prayer, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then what does it say? Give us this day our daily bread. Obviously, there's a way in which we can remember that whenever we eat or we're giving sustenance, that that is from God. But I think for me, uh, it's really easy for me to individualize that, right? Give me this day my daily bread. But what does that actually say? Give us this day our daily bread. I think that invitation for a lot of us is also an invitation into radical hospitality and stewardship of the things that God has given. Because I would think most people in this room probably are not really struggling at this present moment with having enough bread or food on the table. Give us this day our daily bread that God has given us collectively as the church enough to go around. That this is an invitation to mission, that God actually would in us praying, give us this day our daily bread, that we remember this is not ultimately mine, this is ours to steward and to use. So my challenge is for us to think in the next two weeks, I was gonna say a week, but I know you might have a lot of plans this week, next two weeks, who can I share a meal with or drink with, coffee, whatever? Who can I share a meal with? Maybe that's having someone over for dinner, Maybe you are a terrible cook. Maybe that's inviting yourself over to someone else's house for dinner. (laughs) Jesus did it. I mean, I'm just, go for it. I feel like I'm probably going to get some people inviting themselves over to dinner at my house, which is great. Please do. Um, And it says, yes, great. (laughs) Uh, Maybe it's going out to eat. Maybe it's buying someone a meal. Maybe you can't do that. Maybe it is literally just the practice of sharing life with one another over a meal or a drink. I want you to note, too, that Jesus was accused, once again, of being a glutton and a drunkard uh, because of who he hung out with. I think the invitation to radically ordinary hospitality from Jesus is not simply to hang out with people who think and look like you do. The invitation from Jesus is that our radically ordinary hospitality would look like our tables looking like nothing that they would look like apart from Jesus. Where people of all different social statuses and backgrounds are sitting and dining together young with old men and women, single, married, Republicans, Democrats, whatever labels you want to put, like a wide range of people eating together. And we see this repeated theme of they were devoted to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper. There's something about the table. In Matthew chapter 26 with the Lord's Supper, we see starting in verse 20, when it was evening, Jesus sat down at the table with the twelve. While they were eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. Greatly distressed, each one of them asked in turn, am I the one Lord? He replied, one of you who has just eaten from the bowl with me will betray me. For the son of man must die, as the scriptures declared long ago, but how terrible it will be for the one who betrays him. It would be far better for that man if he had never been born. Judas, the one who would betray him, also asked, Rabbi, am I the one? And Jesus told him, you have said it. We see Jesus beautifully modeling hospitality here, of welcoming in his disciples who would abandon him, and the disciple who would betray him, and still sharing in them. This was a festival-type meal together, but he shared a lot of normal meals together, not just this one. We see this beautiful hospitality here, and I want to point out this question that Rosaria Butterfield pointed out in her, her book. She said, I think whenever we think about hospitality, we think about the Lord's Supper, we think about communion, we need to ask the same question that the disciples did. Is it I, Lord? Am I the one, Lord? Am I the one? In what ways have I sinned against you? In what ways are there things in my life that are not compatible with who you are? What ways do I need to confess, repent of my sins, and turn to you? Am I the one, Lord? Uh, You may have heard uh, the phrase, uh, love the sinner, hate the sin. Have you all heard that before? Uh, There's some things I like about that, like hate what's wrong but love everybody. But there's also some ways in which I think people use that also as like 
love the center, but like I'm still kind of going to hate them. I mean, really? Right? Y'all have seen it. Probably done it. Um, Rosara Butterfield offered a different way of framing it. She said, love the sinner, hate your own sin. Don't ask, is it them, Lord? Is it I, Lord? Am I the one? In what ways do I have sin in my life that I need to deal with? In what ways do I have biases? What ways do I have patterns in my life that I need to bring before you? And as I've talked about over the past couple of weeks, not in the sense of just like sitting here and like just like feeling guilty over your sin and just ashamed about it. Yes, there's like godly conviction that leads to repentance, but I repent not just because I don't like my sin. I repent because I like what God has way better. And I want what he has. I'm clinging on to this thing that is not as good for me, and I trust him over my own voice. And I want you to note, too, here, I just noticed this last night um, as I was running through this, and it's, I don't know how I didn't notice it before. There's a difference between the disciples who just abandoned Jesus and the disciple who betrayed Jesus in their question. The disciples who abandoned Jesus said, am I the one Lord? Judas said, rabbi or teacher, am I the one? If Jesus is just your teacher, who you can listen to, do what he says if you like it, if it seems to be good advice, it's not the same as Lord. We call this the Lord's Supper. It's an invitation to submit to his lordship, to submit yourself to his mission, to his plans, to his ways, above your own. Am I the one, Lord? And I think uh, a lot of us probably, uh, Jesus, Jesus being Lord does involve him being the teacher. I want to make that abundantly clear. Um, but I think some of us treat Jesus' advice just as if it's a teacher's advice. If I like it, I'm going to do it. If I don't like it, I'm not going to do it. But Jesus isn't only a teacher. He's Lord of our life. You don't have to follow him. I want to make that clear. You don't. But if you do choose to follow him, The invitation is not just for him to be your teacher. It's for him to be your Lord. Repent and believe the good news for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father, Jesus is. So we have an invitation to ask the question, am I the one, Lord? And so as we just get ready, I'm gonna invite the band to come back up to partake in in communion. I want you just to, to spend some time in your own life to ask the question, what sin in my life do I need to bring before the Lord? And I hope what you've seen modeled over the past, I don't know, however however long, uh, I always have sin in my life that I need to repent of and bring it to the Lord. Uh, repentance is an ongoing process for those who are followers of Jesus. As one of my friends wisely said, he said, it's so silly. Um, maybe silly is not the right word. Uh, he definitely didn't say silly. Maybe he said stupid. Might have been more what he said. That Christians start out in faith admitting they're wrong. And then once they become Christians, they become convinced that they're right about everything. We are still wrong and have sin in our life. We're in an ongoing process of becoming more like Christ, which means I need to regularly be repenting of my sin, not just in a sense of like, I'm going to sit here and like wallow in it, but actually because what he has is better. I might not know it. I might not see it. And I also want to point this out too. Um, Psalm 23 this is just brought back up to my mind. Um, it says that he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. To me, there's no like connection that makes it seem like there's a difference for that between walking, God leading us in the paths of righteousness and also walking in the valley of the shadow of death. Uh, what I mean by that is you could be in a season of being like, totally obedient and it feels like you are walking through the valley of the shadow of death you could be in a season of walking in the path of the wicked and it feels like you are sitting at a great feast and having a wonderful party you also be walking with god and it feels like you're in a season of a great feast and it feels wonderful regardless i think the invitation for all of us is that we are invited to come and sit in the presence of god there's a parable that jesus tells and i've been reflecting on a lot lately where um uh someone who's rich invites all these people to dinner and most of the people that he invites or I think like none of them end up coming. So then he sends out the invitation further to the poor, to the lame and to the crippled. My friends, might I offer that we are all the spiritually poor, spiritually lame, the spiritually crippled. And we desperately need God. We all gotta eat. You don't have to sit at the table, but you have a seat. 
And for those of us that follow Jesus, I would encourage you sit at the table of God and feast in his presence, taste and see that he is good. And just regularly invite other people to come and join you. Invite them into your table as a reflection of the welcoming love that comes from God, of his radical acceptance. Verse 26 of, from Matthew. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples saying, take this and eat it for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, each of you drink from it for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Mark my words, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. And they sang a hymn and went out to the Mount of Olives. So what we're going to do is, um, while the band plays, um, I'm going to be up here. I would encourage you to take some time to just come before the Lord, get your heart right with God. Um, if you are a follower of Jesus and want to participate in uh, the Lord's Supper, um, I'll be right up here to administer the elements to you. But take your time. Um, and if you're not in a place to do it, great. And I hope you are. Um, but you've all been invited to participate in the life of God, to sit at his table. And the question for I think most of us is, who are you inviting to sit with you? Who are you gonna invite in the next two weeks to sit at your table? Hey, thanks for watching the service. We pray that it bless you and helps you grow closer to God. If you are in the Nashville area, we'd love for you to join us sometime. If you're not in the Nashville area, we'd love to help you get connected with the local church if you don't already have one. But we pray that God blesses you this week and that he grows you closer in your relationship with him and with your community, and that he uses you in a powerful way to be a vessel of his good news in everywhere that you go. May God bless you.